Thanks, Mira. And thank you again, Jonathan, for joining me. Um, I, that is such a phenomenal piece. I think that's probably my third time watching it. Um, I really enjoy that piece. And one of the questions that um, I really want to know as an organizer and campaign manager is when did New York City actually implement the reforms that were noted in the film as far as probation in New York City? You, you're on mute, Jonathan. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It was, it was a long road, Hanif. Um, I think they uh, started implementing kiosks in 1996. Um, and that was huge because that uh, that reduced caseloads in half, you know, to about 50 or 60. It was a lot more manageable than 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 when it was what it was previously. They even uh, New York City even tried marketing kiosks around the country, but when uh, Texas pushed back, they had to book, back off. Still, by 2003, many agencies around the country had adopted kiosks. Uh, I think early release upon rehabilitation occurred in 2011, um, and then 2011 to 2013. Uh, New York City decentralized its operations uh, uh, to the seven most disadvantaged of, uh, neighborhoods of New York City where most people on probation live uh, and enabling one-stop shopping with uh, associated social services. But it was tough going at first because uh, a lot of, you know, the neighborhoods looked at probation as being an ally of the New York City police who are conducting stop and frisk. And they frankly didn't want any part of it. So that actually, <laughs> the move to decentralize was the catalyst for New York City to uh, adopt a re fully rehabilitated approach and to work hand in glove with the communities. Um, and then there's been a, a, a evolution since then. I think uh, they stopped, New York City stopped violating for, te for technical violations, as you mentioned earlier, you know, what a problem that is. Uh, and now they don't even violate you if you've been arrested. They wait to see if you've been convicted. Um, and finally, they, you know, they're in terms of uh, the unannounced home visits, they now give warning about those instead of sending officials crashing through your front door. So, you know, it's been a long road, but I think uh, the results, you know, show that it paid off. Yeah, definitely. And I could see the impact from um, one of the uh, probation officers. I think her name was Sharon or Shannon. Yeah. Um, were there additional probation officers who actually got hands on involved with the class? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There were um, several. Well, let's say maybe a dozen altogether. Because they, you know, they subscribed to the aims of the project, which was were to impart a, a marketable skill to the probation clients on the one hand, and then to undo the negative image of of the practice in the media, which would allow it to be viewed more positively, and and uh, therefore uh, live up to its potential as an alternative to mass incarceration. So yes, many subscribe to that. So we have a question in the chat, and I think it ties into what we're saying. So with the legislation that New York City implemented to uh, decentralize and prevent incarcerations um, for individuals on probation and building relationships uh, between probation officers and the individuals they monitor while cutting case caseloads, did it actually bring the crime rate down and reduce recidivism in New York? We think so. Um, New York City is one of the safest big cities in the country, and the commissioner of New York City, the, uh, the commissioner, commissioner of New York City uh, Department of Patients, shown in the film, Adam Bermudez, she feels very strongly that her agency is a big part of that, and we think so too. Wow, wow, that's awesome! Especially, like you said, for New York City to be such a safe big city, that is phenomenal to hear. And I'm curious, I know that it was a book long with this and um, this project was, it sounded like implemented two or three years ago. Did the pandemic um, affect the classes and the project that you guys were doing at all? Yeah, it did. I mean, March of 2020, every, all the classes shifted online. And uh, even when the pandemic eased up, uh, they remained online because that was, tur it turned out that, that even though we had been conducting the classes in those seven decentralized uh, neighborhoods of uh, de uh, neighborhoods of New York City. There were many many people who couldn't attend any of those uh, in person, but wound up attending to, uh, in the virtual classes. So it worked out well in, in the long run. So talk a little bit more. So some of those photographers who are now finished classes and have completed projects and been recognized by the city council. What are they doing now? 
Uh, some have become, uh, you know, uh, full-fledged professional photographers. Andre, who you saw in the film, is remains the associate director of the Neon Photography Program. Um, Natalie, who is the narrator, is a remains a teacher uh, in that uh, in, in that in the neon photography. Um, I think uh, looking at the other side, maybe um, four percent of all the hundreds of participants wound up rearrested. But that compare that that compares to like fourteen percent uh, of people who hadn't gone through the program, and that wasn't even the original aim. You know, the original aim, as we said, was to impart a marketable skill and to undo and to undo the negative image of the practice. Okay. Wow. That's awesome to hear uh, all the success stories. Um, we got another question for the chat. Um, the comment start it starts off with a comment. First off, amazing film, exclamation point. So many beautiful visuals. How many cities are you in with the vision or, or this project? And how hard is it to bring the vision to a new city? I think I might ask you that, Jonathan, after my first time saying it, right? Like, how can we bring this to That's Delaware? Right. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. And I said, well, we can't. We don't we don't have the bandwidth to do that. But that said, I think, uh, you know, the New York City Department of Probation will uh, be glad to advise, you know, uh, uh, on, on, on how a pro programs like this can be set up. I think, you know, I ju they just tweeted last month um, uh, about the visit to New York City by people from Dover. Uh, and people from Connecticut and even people from Pennsylvania who had who had trooped up to New York City to learn about the Credible Messenger program, you know that that was showcased in the film. You know, people who had who had uh, you know been through probation themselves wind up being pro, you know, in in essence, uh, uh, assistant probation officers. So uh, I think Delaware was able to learn that, and I think uh, New York City would be glad to to uh, impart the lessons, uh, all the other lessons of its practice. Wow. Well, I, I I could believe I probably have multiple organizers, shakers, and movers in the chat because multiple people are saying, how can we get that program here? So I, I hear you with the advice of, of New York City and, and how they've implemented with their probation system and, and your organization not having that capacity and bandwidth. But is this model something that you guys are willing to share that others could implement? Of using a camera, uh, of really utilizing the photography, maybe taking a look at how you guys framed and shaped some of your classes and yes. curricula and other people could duplicate it or we could duplicate it here in Delaware or yes. others. Or <laughs> in this yes, to all of you both. <laughs> yes, okay. we'd be happy to help. Okay. All right, so that means for everybody that is watching this right now and you watch the documentary in a whole new way, um, we could definitely get assistance in creating a program in Delaware where individuals on probation have an opportunity to tell their story through photography, all right? But now we need the professional photographers and such and the resources in Delaware to come out. <laughs> but I'm sure we will collaborate and find a way. But you were touching on a great point. I wanted to make sure I, were, I was answering the questions in the chat. But you were touching already on a great point that you've already been communicating with individuals in Dover. For uh, our legislative allies and others in Delaware um, who aren't on this call, I don't think I've seen any, um, how would they be able to have a copy or sit and view the documentary? Oh, e email me. I mean, info at seeingforourselves.org. I'd be happy to uh, get you the, get you a link. Um, we will do everything we can to support your reform effort. I appreciate that so much. And then how can anybody who is watching um, now or hears about this in Delaware spread the word about the great things uh, that this documentary has done, is done, and the book that is going to be coming out. And, and take a few minutes to talk about the book, please. Yeah, the book. You know, you know, my job as a storyteller of the nonprofit. I was supposed to be writing a book. That was that was my original assignment for my director. Um, but then the pandemic in 2020 hit, and among its among its impacts were bringing the, the publishing industry in this country to a halt through its disruption of supply chains. So Chelsea and George, my colleagues in the nonprofit, they looked at me and they said, hey, Jonathan, you better think of something else. 
Um, and so it was fortuitous that um, we had this footage of interviews with the participants, interviews that I had asked Chelsea to conduct as a resource for, for my writing of the book. And um, you know, I took a second look at the, the footage, and I and I was entranced by the photographers. I mean, I, you know, and so I began to think, well, you know, if I'm entranced, maybe the general public would find it interesting as well. So I just started stitching together that footage with footage we had of the gallery openings, other other footage uh, that I got licensed from stock houses, and then even copyrighted footage that you're you're allowed to to reuse uh, according to U.S. law if you repurpose it for you know from compared to its original purpose. So I just started stitching all that together, found a local video professional in, in Portland, Maine, near, near where I live. He took it to a whole new level and we sent it out there. But now finally, without all that, all that done, uh, a publisher was found who took on the book at the end of last year and it will be coming out June 6th. And it's already gotten you know good notices in, in the probation industry, which were you know, thrilled about. And I think, you know, if you want to see, learn more about the photographers, you can buy the book, you know, because the, they, they tell their own stories and, and, and maybe a third of the book is all is about them. Now, Jonathan, does the book also talk about what made you get involved with probation, right? I, I know the documentary talked about um, the founding of the nonprofit and they wanted to find an impacted population. But could you just share a little bit with our audience watching today what led you to identifying probate uh, individuals on probation as the population for the project? It was New York City. I mean, it wasn't on our on our radar at all. We had just finished um, conducting the program and the housing projects, and uh, it led to a book, Project Lives. Had you know, was didn't sell that many copies, but the images of of the projects. Were, were picked up by the media and, and, and in front of tens of millions of eyeballs. And so that led the city and state to uh, start refunding the projects. And um, so the city rec you know, knew better than anybody else that, yeah, this is a proof of concept that worked. And it was New York City that said, okay, you know, there's another population that's suffering negative stereotypes here. Those are the people on probation. So why don't you go downtown and knock on their door and do that practice there. So that's what got us into probation. We applied for a National Endowment for the Arts grant. Uh, we had the support of one of New York's uh, senators, Christine Gillibrand, uh, and that, which put us over the line. And with the NEA grant in hand, uh, the de probation department created a budgeted slot for Chelsea, the photography teacher, and we were off to the races. Wow, wow, amazing. It's amazing and, and it's great work and I'm telling you, Jonathan, the work that you guys have done is truly inspiring me because it's inspiring myself. Um, I can see it's inspiring everybody who has sat and watched the documentary today to really uh, increase these type of efforts and find ways to make these type of things happen in Delaware. Uh, I'm so pleased if like, we can help in any way. All right, Jonathan. So before I let you go, do you have any closing thoughts? Any any last words that you'd like to say today? Uh, well, keep at it. You know, uh, I mentioned to Mira, you know, before this uh, this uh, virtual event started, that you know maybe other ACLU chapters would be interested. I did notice, for example, that uh, in New Mexico there was an effort to reform probation, and it's it's passed the legislature, but then the Democratic governor veto, vetoed it for some you know procedural reason, apparently. And the ACLU there in New Mexico is reported as being naturally very disappointed. Well, I think, you know, maybe they could figure out a way to leverage this film and other ACL, ACLU chapters as well. And by the same token, the PBS film, if anybody out there has a marketing budget and would uh, care to contribute uh, underwriting to that film, then it would be then it could be seen by millions of Americans. Which and that would really help, you know, uh, make uh, turbocharge the whole re reform effort. Wow. Well, I wish you much success and all the best in continuing to sh show and promote uh, the documentary and the new book that'll be soon to drop. Um, I want to thank everyone for watching. And before you all go, I just want to remind you how big probation change is needed in Delaware and how we can make that happen through Senate Bill 4. SB4. 
Senate Bill 4 seeks to eliminate barriers many face to successfully completing probation sentences and ensures that people won't be sent back to prison for making simple mistakes while on probation. If SB 4 is passed, this bill will benefit everyone serving a Delaware probation sentence, especially those who struggle to meet unnecessary strict requirements that have no relation to the crime that they were sentenced for. Senate Bill 4 will limit probation terms for certain individuals to 12 months. It will prevent incarceration for a technical violation when no new crime has been committed. It will create customized terms of probation to allow for individuals to be productive residents. SB 4 will ensure reentry service providers have the resources to meet the needs of the people coming home from prison. It will also ensure that individuals have representation at all violation of probation hearings and establish effective data collection and management. With your support, we can get SB4 passed. You can sign the petition on the ACLU of Delaware website. The chat is in the Zoom link. Or you can contact me, the Smart Justice Campaign Manager, Hanif Salam at hsalam at aclu-de.org to find other ways to support. But we are going to continue to push for probation reform in Delaware. I thank you all for your support. I thank you all for joining us for the virtual screening. Again, I thank Jonathan Fisher for coming out, allowing us to show his documentary in a whole new way that has received many, many accolades across the country through film festivals and is recognized by the New York City as an effective program in helping employ and change the mindset of individuals on probation. So I hope you all enjoyed this virtual screening and I hope you will join us in future events. Just uh, always check out our website aclu-de.org, check out the issues under the Smart Justice link, and you can stay up to date on what's going on. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.